This is the BBC. For details of our complete range of programmes, go to bbcworldservice.com forward slash podcasts. Welcome to the latest global news compiled in the early hours of the morning on Sunday the 31st of December. I'm Jonathan Blake with a selection of highlights from across BBC World Service News today. Coming up, a third day of protests in Iran. We'll hear how far the demonstrations have spread and what the government's response has been. Also in the podcast, the former Egyptian president and more than a dozen others have been sentenced to three-year jail terms. The defendants, all of them, have been found guilty of inciting demonstrations, defaming judicial personnel and attempting to topple the state. The vicious murder of a 15-year-old girl in Germany, allegedly by an Afghan immigrant claiming to be the same age, prompts calls for age checks among asylum seekers. The government in Nepal bans solo climbers from scaling its mountains, including Everest, in an attempt to reduce accidents. But will it make a difference? Clearly, if you do have a slip or a block of ice or a rock hits you and you run ropes, you're solo, free climbing, then you're going to fall and probably fall to your death. But um, it won't necessarily mitigate against it. And why leading politicians in Lebanon are taking to publishing pictures of themselves with their pets. But first, in Iran, the sound of demonstrations has been heard across the country for a third day. Death to Rouhani, they chanted, referring to the reformist president. But as the Iranian government tells people to avoid what it called illegal gatherings, videos posted on social media show that the protests have turned violent in a number of towns and cities across the country. At least two people in the western town of Dorud are seen being shot. In Abar, in the north, protesters burned a large banner with a picture of Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. Kazra Naji of BBC Persian has been following events. These demonstrations started on Thursday in the city of Mashhad in northeast Iran. And uh, by all signs, it was supposed to be a small demonstration encouraged by the hardliners against the government of President Rouhani. Uh, they wanted to protest against rising prices and the government's inability to check these prices and so on. But the demonstration got out of control in a sense that a lot more people joined in. And then the slogans changed. It became very political in nature. And from there on, it spread to other cities in the province in northeast Iran. And then the next day, yesterday, the protests spread to other big cities in Iran, about a dozen or so. And today they have continued. After it has become dark in Iran, there are still demonstrations in at least nine cities throughout the country. And now some pro-government demonstrations as well. How big are they compared to the protests we've seen? The protests, the pro-government protests and demonstration was uh, planned way before, before the last three days. But it took a, a new significance in a sense that it was important for them to come up with this show of force, if you like. They came uh, out in thousands, as you would expect of a government-sponsored demonstration. But nevertheless, all the attention was on the anti-government demonstrations a couple of kilometers to the south near Tehran University, where uh, the students and a small group of demonstrators clashed with the police. And what sign is there from the government that they are ready to listen to the demonstrators' concerns? What has their response been? Firstly, they are saying that these uh, anti-government demonstrations are illegal, they have to be stopped, and the police will deal with demonstrators harshly. At the same time, there are these government officials and politicians in Iran on both the reformist side and the hardliners saying that, listen, OK, we might call the demonstrators agents of foreigners or anti-revolutionaries, but the fact remains that there is the widespread discontent, particularly because of jobs, because of high prices, and we have to pay attention to that. But nevertheless, these things are happening, and they are undermining the regime and the regime's claim to legitimacy. Kazra Naji of BBC Persian. 
It's another jail sentence for the former Egyptian president, Mohamed Morsi. He was given three years in prison for insulting the judiciary. Mr Morsi, who was democratically elected after a rebellion in 2011, was overthrown by the military after mass protests against his Islamist policies. I asked our reporter in Cairo, Hanan Razek, to give us more details. Morsi, along with other 19 defendants, have been sentenced to three years in prison, but the case includes five others who have been fined to over $1,000 each for insulting the judiciary. The defendants, all of them, have been found guilty of inciting demonstrations, defaming judicial personnel, and attempting to topple the state using Twitter accounts and spreading uh, hate speech, insulting the judges and the judiciary. Mohamed Morsi was overthrown four years ago. Remind us what happened then and what has happened to the former president since then? Since he was toppled back in 2013 after large demonstrations taken to the street, he was then toppled and ever since he's been facing a number of trials, he's been actually sentenced to 25 years for spying with Qatar. Also, he has another sentence of 20 years for inciting violence back in 2012, inciting violence that led to the death of a number of protesters as clashes erupted between protesters and uh, a number of Morsi uh, supporters outside the presidential uh, palace back in 2012. He's also still facing retrials related to espionage and a jailbreak back in 2011. And earlier this year, uh, he's also been listed on the terrorism list. Uh, and this is according to a recent terrorism law that was passed in 2015. And it means that he's banned from traveling authorities Authorities can freeze his assets if proven used uh, in terrorism-related activities and they are not issuing him a new passport. What about Mohamed Morsi's supporters? How much is, is heard from them? It's a good question, uh, Jonathan. When we were at the court earlier today, uh, we didn't really see many supporters outside, unlike what is usual in these cases in the last uh, few years between 2011 and until a few years ago. But at the moment, you don't really see many supporters taken to the streets. And Morsi supporters are vocal, but mainly on social media. You can see them online, uh, but not in the streets anymore. But it's part of the wider atmosphere in Egypt at the moment. Anan Razek in Cairo. In the United States, a suspect has been arrested after a man was shot dead by police in what's thought to have been a so-called swatting prank by someone playing a video game. Vanessa Heaney picks up the story. This is the story of a prank which went terribly wrong. On Thursday evening, the emergency services in Wichita in the American state of Kansas received a call. This is 911. What's going on? I had to argue with my mom and dad. Okay, tell me exactly what happened. They were arguing and I shot him in the head and he's not breathing anymore. He then went on to say he'd taken his family hostage. I'm just pointing the gun at them, making sure they stay in the closet, my mom and my little brother. Yeah, I'm thinking about, because um, I already poured gasoline all over the house, I might just set it on fire. Okay, well we don't need to do that, okay? So the police went to the address given by the caller. And there, an officer fired a single shot, killing Andrew Finch, a father of two, as he stood in the doorway, unarmed. The officer thought Finch was reaching for a gun. They then entered the house and found there was no dead father and no hostages. It had been a hoax. There's been speculation that the call was the result of a row between two gamers playing the video game Call of Duty online, although the address raided was apparently unconnected to either player. Police believe the prank was an act of what's known as swatting, where a person makes a false report to send the authorities to another person or fake address. It's not a new phenomenon. The police in the U.S. receive several hundred of these calls a year, costing them thousands of dollars of wasted police time. They've now arrested a 25-year-old Californian man in relation to the incident. Vanessa Heaney. Young people seeking asylum in Germany could face tests to prove their age under plans put forward by Chancellor Merkel's Conservative sister party, the CSU. Our Europe editor Mike Sanders told me that the idea was prompted by a number of crimes carried out by migrants claiming to be underage, including a murder, only three days ago. 
A teenage girl was murdered in a, a western town called Kandel. Uh, she had an argument with what had been her boyfriend, uh, an Afghan asylum seeker, outside what Americans call a drugstore, we'd call a chemist store, and he's allegedly stabbed her to death. Now, the young Afghan says he's actually 15, and this is quite important in terms of the treatment that asylum seekers get, because if they say they're under, under 18, then they get better treatment from the municipalities that are putting them up, and they're also far far less likely to be deported. So the age question is very important. There's an, another case as well, a, a guy called Hussein K, who's an Iranian asylum seeker, who's on trial at the moment for a very similar sort of case. So it's a, it's a boiling issue, really, in Germany. Is there a fail-safe way to prove someone's age? Not a fail-safe way. There is a way of assessing kind of minimum growth, a minimum age, and it's done by x-raying the hand is one way of doing it. So you look at the development of the bones in the hand. The collarbone is another place you can assess pretty much the minimum age a person must have reached to have got that kind of bone growth. So there are some tests, but at the moment it's done in a much more ad hoc sort of way. The asylum seekers are interviewed and the person interviewing them takes a, a rough guess at how old they might be because of course they won't have papers with them generally and after their travels and if there's a doubt there are 600 youth workers working around Germany who will take a, a kind of final educated guess as to how old they might be but they operate in the 16 German states and all to a different standard. And are these tests going to become a legal requirement? No, not yet. It's very early stages. The CSU wants to bring this up in the coalition talks with the Social Democrats. And the Social Democrats uh, agree that there should be some kind of standardisation across Germany, but they're not at all happy about the kind of arbitrary nature of mandatory tests. They, they think it's an illiberal policy. It could be seen as discriminatory. So this could well be a bit of a sticking point in the coalition talks. Our Europe editor Mike Sanders. The latest edition of a Japanese dictionary that's updated only every decade is to include a raft of new words related to the nuclear industry. Most of the new terms in the Kojien dictionary were not widely used when the last version was published before the Fukushima nuclear accident in 2011. Our Asia-Pacific regional editor Michael Bristow reports. Included for the first time is the word hiro, which means to decommission a nuclear reactor as also a term for the phrase safety myth, an idea once promoted by the Japanese government that nuclear power was not dangerous. That was before the meltdown at the Fukushima nuclear power plant. Editors at the dictionary began collecting possible new words immediately after the accident. They trawled media outlets and the internet and have included words that are now embedded in the Japanese language. Michael Bristow. You're listening to Global News, the most important stories and the best interviews and on-the-spot reporting from the BBC World Service. Every weekend you can hear a review of the week's main news stories and why they matter. That's in the world this week and the programme is also available to download from our website. Go to bbc.co.uk forward slash programmes. Now to the Philippines and to one particular stretch of golden sand. It's become a magnet not only for surfers, but for those who reject the nine-to-five lifestyle as megacities such as Manila. Ubistondo Beach in the province of La Union is the place we're talking about, but now an international hotel chain is building a new resort, and there are fears that this unique community will be ruined. Our Philippines correspondent Howard Johnson reports. One thing I hate about Manila, and I'm sure everyone not just Filipinos, but even foreigners will agree, traffic is hell. You spend half your life in traffic. I was so miserable. I'd cry before going to work because I didn't want to go to work. After years of working in the call center business, Ali Desini decided to pack up her life and move to Urbis Tondo to become a surf instructor. A year on, she now lives by the sea and juggles part-time surf work with running an organic chocolate business. She's in Manila to pick up supplies, but is itching to return to the coast. I want to go back to that world I discovered, the surfing world. It still has the beach vibe thing, and it's just so laid back, and I think simple living. Herbis Tondo in the province of La Union is a five-hour drive north of Manila. I wanted to see for myself why it's such a draw. So I'm here on Urbis Tondo Beach. It's a, a long, sandy beach with bamboo huts and some small hotels. There are around 50 or 60 beginner surfers 
with local guides teaching them how to get onto their boards, lots of them falling off, first attempts. Let's walk along the beach now and speak to some people about why they've come to La Union. Matteo Fabregas owns Mad Monkeys, a popular burger bar hangout. So has business grown since you've been here? Yeah, business has grown. This, this is a spot now, you know, there's good surf and there's a good vibe and great energy in this area, so yeah, it's boom. <laughs> so look at that. Tons of buses stopping and going. One of the big draws to La Union is its surf breaks. They are some of the best in the country and the reason why the first international surfers were drawn to Urbis Tondo in the 1960s. Aki-san, nice to meet you. <laughs> I started surfing here since 1967 or 68. 69 year old Aki has the look of a man who spent most of his life in the sea. He's in good shape, sinuous, tanned, and sporting a slicked back hairstyle of a rocker from the 1950s. He grew up on the outskirts of Japan and worked in a surfboard factory. After the death of his parents, he decided to leave Japan and move to Urbis Tondo for good. I just teaching some local because uh, no surfboard, then just teaching the local and then local surfing getting better. So a flourishing community of surfers backed by big spending weekend visitors from Manila. But could this special community be under threat? So I've just taken a stroll along a quieter stretch of the beach and come to a, a new construction, a new project that's going on. There are two huge mounds of sand here and in front of it, green construction hoardings with big posters on the front. They're advertising a hotel chain called Waves, a photo of a guy on a surfboard and it says, ride the wave of a new lifestyle revolution. But some people still need convincing. Camille Pilia is a keen surfer. The community here is different. Like, we're not all just business people who want to turn La Union into the next big travel destination. And we have been working together to create small projects to preserve um, ocean health and to keep the beach clean and um, to prevent big corporations from really just destroying the place because that's what we came here for. We came to La Union because we love we love it here. We love the vibe and we won't we don't want to trade that away for, you know, just some extra money or just some extra property. It doesn't work that way anymore because of how, like I said, this young generation of creative entrepreneurs and individuals, we see value in other things more than more than money and profit. Camille Pilar from Urbis Tondo in the Philippines, ending that report by Howard Johnson. A record number of climbers have tried to conquer the world's highest mountain, Everest, this year, but among the record-breaking attempts, several people have died. Now the government in Nepal is taking action to try and reduce accidents and has banned solo climbers from scaling its mountains, including Everest. Alan Hinks is a successful climber who's reached the summit of Everest and many of the world's other most challenging peaks. And Claire McDonnell asked him what he thinks of this decision. Well, as usual, it's a lack of understanding by politicians and bureaucrats. You know, someone who's massively experienced just to tie them on to somebody else who might not be that experienced so that the climbing as a, as a couple isn't going to make it any safer, really. We had this recent tragedy, though, and I know that you knew the Swiss climber, Uli Steck, died in April this year when he fell from a steep ridge during a solo climb to a peak neighbouring Everest. Yeah. I guess they look at that and they think, well, what could we do to possibly... I mean, you can never rule it out entirely because it's, it, it's a highly dangerous thing that these people are undertaking. But they look at that and think, well, maybe this would mitigate against things like that happening, would it? Well, that's true. I can understand the thought processes there because clearly if you do have a slip or a, a block of ice or a rock hits you and you're unroped, you're solo, free climbing, then you're going to fall and probably fall to your death. But um, it won't necessarily mitigate against it. We don't know what happened to Uli Steck. You know, he might have been hit by a lump of rock or a lump of ice. Well, then, if that had happened and you were a pair, you'd have both fallen to your deaths. And anyway, mountaineering is about freedom. You should be able to make your own decisions, really. We are the people, I know it sounds pompous me saying it, but we are the people that know what we're doing. We are the people 
that are experienced. There are a lot of inexperienced people out there and, uh, you know, incompetent people and uh, a couple of incompetent people could tie themselves together on a rope and uh, they're going to have an accident. What do you think the way forward is on this? Do you think they should understand and look at in maybe more detail the people are going up the mountains and then make a case-by-case -case decision? Well, that's, again, that's more meddling and bureaucracy and cost and whatever. I mean, I could even say it's Nepal's mountain and, you know, Nepal can make any rules and regulations they wish, just as we can. You know, I mean, who am I to pontificate on what the Nepal government should do, really? I'm a Brit, aren't I? But, uh, you know, mountaineering is supposed to be about freedom. I think they should leave it as free as possible. Perhaps Everest is a special case. Maybe they can put a few controls there, but I'm shooting myself in the foot saying that, I'm sure. You have quite a record. You're the first British mountaineer to have claimed all 14 mountains with elevations greater than 8,000 metres, the so-called 8,000ers. Um, mm. And you summited Mount Everest in May 1996. Why do you love it so? I think it's just something in me, you know. I just love the freedom of being able to get out climbing, you know, and I have done a bit solo climbing. I've even recently been solo climbing in, in the English Lake District on frozen waterfalls. It's a bit like a drug to me. It just perks me up, does, as mountain and climbing. I don't have a death wish, I have a life wish. It does enhance my life climbing, it really does. Makes it sound very tempting, the British climber Alan Hinks. Now, a quick search on Twitter for the Nigerian president, Muhammadu Buhari, shows there are plenty of people unhappy with him. The reason? Well, he's been appointing dead people to head government boards and agencies. Ishak Khalid reports from Abuja. The appointment of several dead persons to head government agencies is seen by many as a major goof by the Nigerian government. A former senator, Francis Okpozu, died in December 2016, but his name appeared in a list of more than 1,400 new government appointees. He is supposedly to head the Nigeria Press Council. A former inspector general of police and a priest who both died earlier this year have also been appointed. Many Nigerians are deeply surprised to see the names of dead people in the list of new government appointees. But a spokesperson for President Muhammad Buhari told the BBC that the list had been made more than two years ago and apparently has not been reviewed before it was released on Friday. He said the dead appointees would be replaced. Ishak Khaled. Now, many of the stories we bring you from Lebanon on the Global News podcast involve bombs, murder, refugees and political disputes. But now there's some rather different news involving leading politicians posting pictures of themselves with their pets. To explain, here's our Arab Affairs editor, Sebastian Usher. Well, it's quite a cosy image. You see the President Michel Aoun with his dog nestling up to him, seem to whisper in his ear, and Wali Jumblat, who was once a warlord in the bad old days of the Civil War, with his dog snuggled up to him. But the message, actually, that they're sending is a much stronger one. There's been a video circulating recently online in Lebanon. And it shows, you hear there, that is a truck from the municipality in south of Beirut. And this video shows two dogs, two stray dogs, dying in considerable pain, one in convulsions, and then a member of the municipality picking one up by its tail and dumping it in a van. Now, that has stirred a lot of outrage in Lebanon. There is a petition at the moment on change.org, which has risen from about 30,000 to almost 40,000, demanding change, demanding a strengthening of the animal rights laws, which were brought in actually just back in the summer. Lebanon didn't have very strong animal rights laws. Now, in his post, the President Awu not only showed his dog and expressed his sadness over what happened, and that this is the wrong way of dealing with dogs, but he referred to that, saying that essentially, you know, we have in place now protection for animals in Lebanon. But what people are saying and what groups that uh, shelter stray animals in Beirut and elsewhere say is that they're not strong enough and that this way of killing dogs, of poisoning them, although stray dogs have always been a problem in Lebanon. Uh, there's disease, there was once rabies, all that kind of thing. So they have to be dealt with, that it needs to be done in a humane way. And unlike a lot of other Arab countries, Lebanon, Beirut particularly, it seems very chic to have dogs, to have pets. There are some outrageously weird 
and strange dogs that people walk around with. So it's very much a part of a culture there. But there are thousands of stray dogs who, for whatever reason, end up on the streets. And as we're seeing from this petition, there are many, many people who take it very seriously. And as you say, Beirut, Lebanon faces many other big challenges, the refugees, the risk of terrorism, etc. But they do care about their dogs. And I think there will be some action taken and there will be some change. Our Arab Affairs editor, Sebastian Asher. The ancient Romans are well known for their legions, their vast empire and gladiator contests in the Colosseum. But apparently they were also fond of a practical joke, according to new research into an ancient silver bowl. To explain, here's Richard Hamilton. The Tantalus Bowl was dug up from underneath a clothing store in the Croatian town of Vinkovci in 2012, but its significance was only fully realised after being studied by Dr Richard Hobbs, who's the Western curator of Roman Britain at the British Museum. The object, which dates from the 4th century AD, appears to be a normal drinking vessel, but it's actually what's known as a greedy cup. Below the small silver figure of Tantalus inside the bowl, there lies a pipe which causes liquid to drain out of the bottom of the bowl, splashing the unsuspecting imbiber. In classical mythology, Tantalus was condemned to stand in a pool of water, and every time he bent down to take a drink, the waters receded. Richard Hobbs says the joke would be on a dining guest who was condemned to suffer a similar fate. So what we seem to have here is um, an example of what was called in the ancient world a tantalus or greedy cup. And they actually are described in one of the sources. Basically, the idea is that you give this to someone uh, either as a joke or because they're, perhaps they drink too much. And when the liquid is poured in, it covers them in, in the wine because um, it's likely to have been used for drinking wine. So that's why this object is very important because it seems to be an example of one of these gre so-called greedy cups. And there aren't any others known, uh, as far as I know, from the ancient world. Dr Hobbs says it's possible that the bowl was owned by one of two Roman co-emperors, Valentinian I and his brother Valens, who were both born in Vinkovci. The original will go on display at a museum there, but Dr Hobbs has commissioned a replica to show how the greedy cup works. This will be used as a teaching tool at the British Museum. It's evidence that although the Roman Empire was certainly ruthless, it also appreciated comic moments. In the 3rd century AD, for example, the Emperor Elagalibus invented the first whoopee cushion. Richard Hamilton reporting. And as the year comes to an end, don't forget that there have been some great podcasts from the BBC World Service over the past 12 months, and there's lots that are worth going back to if you missed them the first time round. For some extraordinary first-person stories from around the world, there's Outlook, or download In the Studio. That's the podcast which takes you into the minds of the world's most creative people. Just search for Outlook or In the Studio wherever you get your podcast. And don't forget our brand new podcast series, The Assassination. That is all from us for now, but an updated version of the Global News podcast will be available for you to download later. And as always, if you want to comment on this edition or the topics we cover, you can send us an email. The address is globalpodcast at bbc.co.uk. We'd love to hear from you. I'm Jonathan Blake. Until next time, goodbye.